I've been asked to say a few words about a project that's been uh, originated in Liverpool, um, but it was from one of the surgeons at the Royal Liverpool Hospital. Uh, it's called the Liverpool International Transplant Initiative, and my, my involvement was simply that I happened to be sitting in the room when the surgeon uh, asked if he could use the, the computer software that's being used in the northwest of England to support the transplant and nephrology system, uh, which I was supporting at that time and managing. I offered, I said, oh, if you need any help, then just let me know, I, expecting that I would do some configuration from Liverpool. And immediately he said, oh, come with us, we're going to Gaza next month. And so, at that point, I need to hold my hand up and say, you know, I was working full time, I was aware of problems, Palestine, but I had no idea really of the in-depth issues that were going on in, in that area. So this was very enlightening. We went to Gaza and what I'll do is I'll talk you through uh, effectively what happens when we go. So since then, that was back in... 2013, so we've been now going for 10 years. Dr. Hamad, Abdul Qadir Hamad, he goes three times a year to do transplants. I support him and I, I've been going maybe once or twice a year, for, for, except for the period of the pandemic. So I have got some experience of the issues that are happening. Uh, so I just want to give you a little bit of a picture, and I'll, I'll show you. We do have a we do have a website, and there's an awful lot of information, uh, both in English and in Arabic, on this website. If you get a, a chance, please go and have a look at it. Uh, there is an awful lot of information. But what happens? Dr. Hamad, his intention was to go to Gaza. And we do this via the WHO, the World Health Organization. That's the only way we can get in. We get permits. That's not always easy either. We kept waiting and waiting, and we push and ask, and usually we get admitted. Not always at the time we expect to go, but nevertheless, we usually get in. The idea was that we, we go in, and he would train a team of nephrologists and surgeons and it, where necessary bring them out of Gaza and train them, train them here in Liverpool or anywhere and we've, we've tried that. It's so, so difficult just getting visas. When people come out, it's obviously people are leaving their families, it's not always easy they come out, they don't like to stay out. It's going to be three years training. So it's a huge problem for them. And then when we do get somebody who's staying for a long time and becoming trained, it becomes a problem for them because they see what it's like living out of the country. And you know, they're sometimes then reluctant to go back to the conditions that they've had to work in. As much as, as described, the clinicians there, and I, I will say a little bit more about this later in relation to the transplant project. Um, it's always very, very difficult for the clinicians, the lack of resources. And as I say, I'll say a bit more about that. Anyway, the transplant initiative, it's now been going on for 10 years. We are still struggling to get a team trained. Dr. Hamad is still going in two, three times a year. He's currently here, so he sends his apologies. He's currently in Jerusalem and will be going back into Gaza very shortly. Um, hence why you're stuck with me. Um, so, transplant. There is no transplant options for people in Gaza. Um, so what happens? People suffer from CKD chronic kidney disease. Once you start suffering from chronic kidney disease, you need some form of therapy. There's really, well, there's three types of therapy. You can either have peritoneal, 
um, dialysis, which cleans your blood via the, a tube going into your stomach. You can have hemodialysis, which is where the needles go in and the blood is clean, taken out, cleaned it by a machine and pumped back in. And of course, the third type of therapy is the transplant, which, is, which would be perfect. That is not an option, unless you happen to have an awful lot of money uh, and you can then go out to Jordan or to Egypt. So this project would be a lifesaver for a lot, a lot of people. And again, what happens when somebody suffers from CKD? It doesn't just affect that person. They need dialysis three times three times a week for three hours. It takes up your life effectively, just keeping alive in the hope that in the future you may have a transplant. So you go into the hospital, you go onto a machine and you, you're dialyzed. The, the wards uh, struggle. The machines, they usually, the dialysis machines are usually used for maybe three years here in the UK, that's about their life expectancy. At the moment, there is machines being used in Gaza that have been there six, seven, eight years. They can, some of them get replaced occasionally by other charities, but there's so many that, you know, these machines are way, way past their sell-by days. Not, not only that, in the hospital, not just uh, Shifa, where the dialysis takes place, but in many other hospitals. We talked about the power problem. You know, power is usually on for four hours a day, maybe, give or take two hours, usually take. Um, and what happens is you have a standby generator. A standby generator to kick in if the electricity were to give out. What happens in Gaza is the generators are having to be used for effectively for the rest 20 hours a day. And we get electricity for four hours. The generators again are there because they would be used intermittently, very rarely, hopefully, um, and they wouldn't be used again for more than four or five years. And they have been there for years. So keeping people alive, keeping the hospitals going. We've been in a situation where a, a transplant was taken, was, was being performed, and the power cuts out. So we had people, we had doctors with mobile phones using their torches to enable the transplant to continue. So th these are just some of the, some of the issues. I, I mentioned peritoneal dialysis, which is where the, 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 the blood is cleaned by putting a tube into the stomach. It's less invasive than hemodialysis and specifically for children if you were in this country if a child was suffering from chronic kidney disease the last thing the last option would be hemodialysis because it is very invasive and it's not, not very nice however in Gaza this is not an option because of the water supply you need clean water constantly it's not an issue it, it can't be done so the children, if you, luckily you don't have to see them, but if you go into a ward in uh, Rantisi Hospital, which is the children's hospital in Gaza, then it's heart-rendering. It pulls your heartstrings to see these poor kids attached to machines with their parents trying to comfort them. And this has to be done three times, three times, a, a, day, three times a week. You know, so it's, it's frightening and how anybody can watch stand by and watch that and allow this to happen, it's beyond belief really. So when you arrive, I mean, I'm sure you've heard this anyway, it's like a prison. So we, you approach, you go through multi-layer security and then once you're in, they, the guards wave goodbye to you. And no matter how old you are, young, how much of a burden you've got, how any health problems, you just push through, push through these gates. And you have to make your own way through 
over a mile of caged walkways. Uh, now that there is a um, there is a service that will take you um, if if you're struggling, you don't have to walk. But for many years, we we had to drag any any luggage, any belongings, and you see women, children, older people who struggle just trying to get from one side to the other. You go, once we get there, we're usually greeted by a committee from the Ministry of Health who sing the praises of the project and, and offer to help as much as they can, but then really not much happens, to be quite honest. Um, as you can see here as well, then there's a review of the patients and then the following day, off they go. Now, at the moment, when we started, there were two, two or three surgeons involved. Now there's only one. So Dr. Hamad, he has to extract the kidney from the donor. And these are all, he's done now over 100 transplants. It, it, that's, that's an awful lot of lives affected, by the way, it's not just 100. As I say to you, it doesn't just affect one life. It affects a whole family. Um, so it's, it's amazing what, what he's doing. So he has now to do the extract the kidney from the donor, and then he has to do the implant as well. So, and he does this, he's having a break here, and um, you can see having, having a, an hour between the preparation of the next patient and, and doing the, the implant. Then, at the end of that, in the evening, he will go back to the hotel, quick shower, out again to do a ward round. So, and this goes on, this can go on for four or five days, depending on how many patients we have. <clears throat> so, it's just to give you a rough idea of, of what happens. Then, you, you, ha you come to the end, and we have to... We have to then take samples back for the potential, the next patients that we're going to see. And that in itself is a problem because quite often we've taken the, we've taken the blood samples which come back for tissue typing uh, to check on the matching and we can't get the blood samples out because the guards go, what have you got there? Ah, blood, ooh, there could be something bad in there. You can't do that, oh, take them back. And then we have to negotiate again with the WHO and eventually get permission. Uh, so it's, it's complete and utter you know, shambles of what is being imposed on, on the health service. As I say, <clears throat> the, the problems that confront this service, the transplant and nephrology service, you, you can just extrapolate and say, these are things that happen right across the medical field in Gaza. It's not just in this area. And so you can imagine, uh, we, there are so many people. When we started this project, there were 600 patients on dialysis. Now there are 1,200. The resources that the people are being given, we can't cope. The, the, you get an extra nurse here. You know, the, the, we have to then get materials for the, the dialysis. And so what we started with is three, three shifts on the nephrology, on the dialysis ward. Uh, so people were working from, say, 7 o'clock in the morning until 7 at night. The only way that they've now been able to cope is going to four shifts. So now the doctors and nurses are working from 6 a.m. until 11 p.m. So they're working 12-hour shifts. It, it can't continue. You know, it's, we're, they're at breaking points. And when we tell them what's happening, every, everybody says, please tell people what is going on here. And so this is why I think this project, the, the flotilla, is so important, raising the awareness of people, like, like me, like I used to be, um, to try and get home to them the problems that are being caused by this siege and uh, the other thing I should mention is whenever there's a war, it's not just the, the people who are being bombed who are dying. 
It's also the, the patients in places like the dialysis ward who can't get to, to the treatment centres and they die and literally hundreds potentially have died over that period. So, you know, again, I, I'm sorry to, you know, just harp and it's a very sad and difficult subject to talk about, but thank you for listening.